Okay, well, welcome everyone. I promise I don't have many, many slides to share, so this will only take just a couple minutes. Um, but welcome. This is Employee to Entrepreneur, How to Navigate the Solo Career Transition. And we've got Megan Wally and Betsy Westoff, who will be leading this conversation this evening. Um, we'll do super quick introductions. I'll go over some logistics just because we always have some FAQs that come up in our webinars. And then we'll do the discussion and the Q and Q apparently. Um, that's what happens when I type very quickly, but I promise there will be some answers <coughs> to your questions. Or maybe it'll just be a conversation with more questions. I don't know, that's, that's kind of how coaching goes. You ask questions and we come back with more questions. So um, we are Ama La Vida. We are a career life health and leadership coaching company. We are all about helping you build the life that you love. And I will be, once I'm not sharing my screen, I'll be dropping some links in the chat. If this is something that you are potentially interested in, we offer a free 30 minute consultation where you'll talk with one of our relationship strategists just about what's going on in your life and what your goals are. And they will help First of all, you decide if coaching and Amalavita is the right fit for you. And if it is, they will get you matched with one of our coaches. I'll also be dropping in some links for Megan's business as well. So you can learn a little bit more and potentially talk to her about your financial needs. So with that, um, logistics, this session is being recorded. We will send out the recording to your inbox, but if for whatever reason you don't get our emails or you can't find it or you lose the email, whatever it is, we also post all of our recordings to our YouTube channel. So that'll be up within a day or so of the end of this session. Um, we do have lots of sessions here at Amalavita. We do about one a week. So uh, bit.ly at ALV events will take you to our Eventbrite page where if you haven't visited, we have quite a few that are up there for you to attend. And I know Betsy is leading a free leadership coaching webinar in a couple weeks, which we're really excited yep. about. Um, and then again, I will drop the links in in just a moment when I have both my screens available. Um, all right, and then this is just some basic information we can come back to at the end. All right, and with that, I am going to spotlight Megan and Betsy and hand you off the mic. Great. Thank you and welcome everybody. Um, really appreciate you all joining us today. I'll tell you just a little bit about myself because um, I have had my moments as an entrepreneur. And then I'll tell you how I met Megan and introduce why we decided to, to host this webinar. I started my career um, as an attorney. I worked in, a, in corporate America um, as opposed to in a law firm and spent probably 15 years doing that work. Um, when I left, um, I had a young family and I thought being an entrepreneur might be uh, just the way for me to go. And I actually started a business. It was a marketing a consulting business with a business partner. Um, and we were having a fantastic time. But then 2008, 9, 10 rolled around and the economy was pretty stressful. And um, for a variety of reasons, the business disbanded. I will say along that path, I learned some pretty hard lessons about absorbing um, or engaging with a partner um, along my entrepreneurial path. And so while most of the time that we're going to spend talking to Megan about her shift from corporate America to being a, an entrepreneur, um, I'm glad to lean into some of my lessons around um, uh, looking for a partner as well. Um, long story short, did a number of different things along that path and ultimately became a coach. I was trained as a coach, planning to go off on my own, but then met the founders of Ama La Vida and have had a really nice two and a half year journey um, as a primarily leadership coach with Amala Vida, um, coaching primarily um, people in any variety of business, even if their business is being a nurse or being a teacher, but people who are trying to enhance their leadership um, with, you know, an anticipation of growing into a bigger role. So I'm really enjoying that time. Megan and I actually knew each other. Um, uh, I worked at a nonprofit for a period of time and Megan was on an affiliates board and we got to know each other during that time through some shared marketing interests that we had. Um, and then Megan was nice enough to refer a lovely client to Amala Vida and we started being back in touch through that. 
Um, and ultimately, I just got really curious about Megan and her transition from a large corporation, corporate organization, we'll describe it better, um, into being an entrepreneur and what the differences were and how she decided to leave what appeared to me to be a really amazing job and start this thing on her own. And all of a sudden I realized that could be an amazing topic for a webinar. Um, really, really, Megan and I want this to be casual. So I'm going to lead by asking her a bunch of questions. But if I'm missing the most important question that you want, either Megan and or I to weigh in, again, raise your hand or type into the notes and Libby will help make sure that we get those questions answered. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'll introduce Megan and Megan and I are channeling Brene Brown today. I don't know how many of you follow Brene, but she always starts her webinars by asking her guests, so tell us your story. So I, I'm going to start with Megan by asking her to tell us just a little bit about her story. So here you go, Megan. Great. Well, I won't start all the way at the beginning. I'll keep it career focused, but I always thought of myself as a right brain person. I love to read. I was always really interested in writing. I always kind of veered towards the more creative endeavors, which in contrast to people in my family who now are lawyers, accountants, you know, in the world of finance, I, I just felt my career path was going to be very different. So I went to school to study journalism. I wound up with a Bachelor of Arts in Public Relations. This was at the period of time where magazines were folding and you know newspapers were folding. And I just thought, well, I could do journalism for a company. So I got an internship with the world's biggest PR firm. It's called Edelman Public Relations. And I stayed there for about 10 years with a brief intermission at a smaller shop. But I really focused on marketing and communications for food and beverage brands. Um, Barilla Pasta was my biggest client and I worked with them for about six years. I really loved the work. We did a lot of content creation, um, production. We did everything from you know, calling up journalists to talk about stories to you know, producing YouTube series. And it was, it was definitely a great career. Um, along the way, I went back to business school. I decided to get my MBA and I was kind of shocked to find out that I liked the finance and accounting classes. So that, that was a little eye-opening for me that maybe I do have this left brain that everyone in my family seems to have. And around that time too, so this is maybe 2015, around that time, my father, who was a stockbroker. Um, he'd been in the business for a long time. He's starting to think about, well, I'm, I've had all these clients for 30 years. They have kids, they have grandkids. Um, someone's got to be around when these people are retiring. They're planning for their futures. And, you know, if you're in your 30s and 40s, do you want to hire a 60 year old financial advisor? So he's thinking about legacy planning. And I thought, you're a stockbroker. I have no interest in that. But I started learning a little bit more about the job. And as it turns out, you're kind of a coach. You build relationships with clients. You learn about their goals. You learn about what legacy they want to leave behind. And you help them make a plan. And I thought, I can do that. So I made the switch. Um, I joined my dad in business. And I know there are more questions geared toward how I made that decision. So I will leave it with, I am a financial advisor now, and essentially we are CFOs to individuals, families, um, executives, as they make financial and estate planning decisions. <laughs> Sorry, y'all, I had myself on mute. So as any good coach would, I feel like I just must say, I think one of the big ahas that I'm hearing just in this initial part of the story is that we all tell stories to ourselves about what we're good at and we're not so, what we're not so good at. And those stories may limit our horizon for what we're interested in doing or willing to test. And Megan talked a lot about the left brain, right brain, and then the, the decision to go back to school. I, we didn't hear why you went back. But having that big aha moment, which is, oh, my gosh, I can think over like that, too. And I actually kind of like it. So challenge from a coach, which is 
what's the story that you're telling yourself that may or may not be true and or may or may not limit the kinds of choices you make about whatever it is you may, may decide to do next. So, right. And I um, went to school to be, I thought to be a brand manager, I thought I'll take this experience that I have at an agency where I worked with multiple clients and I will use that to get a good role running a brand in house somewhere at some consumer packaged goods brand. And, you know, that was what my concentration was, but I, you have to take some of these other required classes along the way. So I think the other lesson is really being open to, you know, surprising yourself with what, what else might be out there. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. So the word that's coming into my mind as I think about the next question that I want to ask you is being brave. And so I'm going to use that word, but if you replace it with a different word, that's fine, which is how did you get brave enough to leave the comfort of what you knew and venture off into something that was completely different? It took a really long time. So I, I had a lot of conversations with people in different roles in the industry, people who were like my father and worked directly with clients, people who were more behind the scenes dealing with the data, some you know people that are stock analysts, um, more involved in the investment management. I had conversations with um, market directors who ran large wealth management firms. And I think that's where I kind of came away with the takeaway that this is really a relationship building type of role. And I thought, well, that's kind of what I'm doing now in a different sense. I'm an account manager, a relationship manager for my clients doing marketing, but there's a similar skill set in, you know, understanding what is the client asking for? How can I deliver that in a really simple and effective way? Um, I also did a lot of reading of industry publications, understanding what was going on with the field, what was the future of the field? You know, there was and still is a lot of talk at the time about, well, isn't E-Trade and Robinhood, aren't they going to take over the role of real people that are doing this job? And, um, you know, wanted to make sure that I had a good understanding of the prospects of doing this job. And then the other big piece was understanding the certification and licensing requirements really well. And what was that time commitment going to look like? And how long would it take me? How long before I actually can start doing, doing this job? I mean, there's, there's a whole other element to this of, you know, building trust. If people are turning over a financial decision-making to you, that's a lot of interpersonal skills, but there's also the really basic, if you want to trade stocks on behalf of someone else, if you want to provide financial advice for a fee, there are a lot of um, legal requirements too. Thanks, thanks. And I'm gonna hold on to that word, word brave for a second because here I'm hearing you say you got very prepared by doing a lot of due diligence, so to speak, by talking to people, reading things, understanding the requirements of certification. But what I'm also super interested in, and this comes up many times with us, with our clients, is what are the underlying factors that may make you prepared to take a big left turn? And often people say, well, I've always been an attorney or I've always been a teacher or whatever the thing may be. How can I possibly turn around this corner either to become an entrepreneur or even to look for another career in a different field? And I think the challenge that, that uh, that you seem to have figured out how to, to meet is what are the things that are similar in these roles? And you found the building of trust, that we, I'm guessing the ability to tell a, a truthful and clear story, i.e. a lot of things around communications that gave you the confidence you could translate those skills. So I'm going to pause for a second and ask, is anybody on, um, on the call feeling like they're stuck as they consider starting their entrepreneurial journey in, but I'm really the kind of person who only does this or who has always done that and that the story may in fact be the thing getting in your way. Libby, are you gonna read us the question? Yes, I, I will. I just okay. saw it pop up. Great. So, Great. Um, 
how did you know when you had researched enough or when you were ready? That's a good question. And I think that was more gut instinct than anything else. Like I, I had no more questions. You know, I, I think I started out with a list of types of people that I wanted to talk to information that I wanted to get. And once I felt like I had no more questions to ask, I felt I had what I need to make the decision and the decision was still hard, but um, I felt like I was as prepared as I could be to make it. I was at least going in eyes wide open. And I'll, I'll say when I years ago started my own business, um, I, I felt, again, it was a gut thing too. I felt this sense of momentum. I, I really started to believe that there was a need for what we, my partner and I were um, developing and could deliver. And at some point, you know, the train left the station. So there is that. We're going to talk with Megan about the financial and other implications of leaving you know, corporate America or whatever it is that you're comfortable and safe in. And that those are very real things, but there is this sense that there's a, there's a thing here. This, this, this could be real. And I don't know exactly how that comes into your head. Um, if anyone else on the phone who has started their own business has a story that they want to share about how they knew when they had done enough research, please chime in with that story. Um, we'd love to gather it. Megan, um, Let's lean into some of the more objective and practical considerations, although you and I are both talking about trusting your gut, but what were some of the practical considerations that you took into account and maybe discussed with peers in your network or your husband or your father or whomever you trusted to kind of weigh and balance yeah. the real risk? Yeah, I think the first which felt risky to me was leaving a career that I knew that I loved and that I was good at and a company at which I built a good reputation, um, that felt daunting to me because I had been building that for 10 years. And um, I wanted to make sure that I considered this really thoughtfully, left that company on good terms and you know, felt really strongly that I was making the right move there. The other thing, and this is really practical, is you know, when you're starting out, you don't know what your next paycheck is going to be like you do when you're on a salary and you get that, you know, first and 15th of the month paycheck. So my role now is entirely commission based. Um, we charge a fee for the assets that we manage and that comes to us once a month. And that, you know, if you lose clients that could impact your pay. And if the market is down, that could impact your pay. So that was um, a risk too. And I had to understand and be prepared for the implications of an initial pay cut and a largely commission-based and really variable um, type of pay structure. And I think the final thing, which is perhaps unique to me, but maybe others are in this situation is working with family. Um, so I went into business with my father and we have a had and have a really good relationship, but you know, you never know how something like that is going to impact your relationship. And maybe you're considering a partner that's a close friend um, or someone else that you have a relationship with outside of work. And you, um, again, I think it was, it was more of a gut feeling that, you know, this is, this is a person that regardless of the other roles that he plays in my life, I can be honest with who I expect will be honest with me if something isn't working out the way that either of us had expected. Um, we, we formalized that a little bit too, to make sure that we had times that we were going, we had planned to check in to make sure this is still, this is still working out for both of us. So I would, I would urge that too, so that it doesn't feel like you have to, you know, awkwardly raise your hand and talk about how something isn't working for you kind of formalize that in the way that in corporate America, you might have a performance review already baked into the schedule. Yeah, that's great. So there are some formal considerations um, that you might think you don't need in the in the process of establishing a partnership with somebody when you're becoming an entrepreneur, and you might approach things a little more casually. And then if things don't go as planned, which sometimes they don't, then what's the structure in which you negotiate? You know, right. what comes next? I will tell an anecdotal story here. When I started my own business, uh, the first step after about a year was that my business partner decided 
to go back to corporate America. She wanted the benefits, et cetera. And I really felt the, her loss because she had a very different background from I did. So when we had started the business, we were both coming in as partners, bringing different skills and experiences. So I hustled and interviewed somebody and hired her in a minute because she had exactly the resume I thought that I was looking for. And in fact, our approach to business and our values and a whole bunch of other things were very different and it got very difficult right away. So, you know, there is this process of being patient. It sounds like many of you on the phone are giving yourself that time to weigh and balance and interview and decide. And sometimes the momentum carries you a little bit more quickly and or slowly. And it's just, it's really good to, to be mindful as you make those decisions. Um, anybody have anything they want to ask or I'll carry on with some new questions. Okay, so, uh, oh, sorry, somebody's doing something in the background. Um, what would you say, Megan, has been the most surprising thing, either good and or less good, um, that you've stumbled into in the process of this transition? I think something that really surprised me was how different it would feel coming from a place where I sat down at my computer and every minute of my day was spoken for. I was running from meeting to meeting. I might eat lunch in a meeting and then I would work until the end of the day, go home, maybe log on later to get some work done because I was in meetings all day. And, you know, that was dictated by clients. It was dictated by um, leadership. And in this role that I'm in now, my day is a blank slate, which means I have to be really disciplined about how I use my time. I have to make sure that my business development pipeline is full. And that means that I have to spend a little bit of time every day prospecting and reaching out to people and making sure that people know what I do and um, making it easy for them to connect with us. And I also have to take care of the clients that we have. So I have to make sure that I block time for that. I have to have a really good understanding of all of our investment solutions. So there's reading research reports. Um, and then there's the management of the actual business and the processes and you know administrative things that we all kind of push to the bottom of our to-do list. That's really important too, to keep us all on track. So getting organized in that way, that was a real adjustment, figuring out how when I have a day free of commitments that someone else has imposed on me, how do I use that time and in, in the most effective way? Yeah, that's great. That's great. And that sounds like that's just been a, an aha for you. Um, what, are, what are the great things about being independent? What are you loving about it? I think the personal impact is really rewarding for me. Um, and maybe that has more to do with this switch where before I felt like a small fish in a big pond and I was working on these like really big multi-million dollar campaigns where I didn't know anyone at the receiving end of like maybe my parents bought more pasta because they knew that I was working for Barilla but I don't know that I was like impacting anybody's lives but now I'm talking to people every day and you know I'm helping them figure things out like well, how am I going to pay for my kid's college education in a way that's really tax efficient? And that means I could still save for my own retirement. Um, and I really like that. And uh, I think I think there is also, it's interesting because I did really love the external validation in a corporate role that came with a promotion or a raise or this recognition of something that you did. But it's entirely different now when it's really just you winning a client, you know, increasing your revenue. You have to just shower that praise and validation on yourself, but because you, <laughs> you did it yourself, it's also really rewarding. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're creating your own corporate culture of one, basically. You're right. not reliant on, you know, what shows up. And for all of us who've experienced working from home over the past, two years, uh, I think we all have had a taste of what does it mean to, to kind of create your, your own corporate culture, as mm -hmm. opposed to being acknowledged from the outside or greeted in the morning when you show up, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
it was a weird oh, thing like to, to realize, like there's, I'm never going to get a promotion. That's, it was a strange yeah. thing to sit with. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for many of us who worked in a, a, a setting where there are promotions that are rewards, there are um, bonuses, there are title changes, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's not, that's a big thing to consider giving up. Some of us may love the fact that we don't appear to have to be climbing anymore, but it certainly is very different. Mm -hmm. I think we had a question. Let me see if I can. Yes, um, there was a question. I was waiting for a pause. Um, sure. So what were the most helpful tools that helped you get organized? Hmm. Helpful tools. I mean, I do, I do live and die by my calendar. So the time blocking that I talked about, I, I literally put on my calendar and that's helpful. Our administrative assistant knows this is the hour of the day that she's just reading research reports. So we're not, you know, there's nothing else happening during that period of time. Um, I also try to make sure that, you know, I, I can use like days of the week to help organize that a little bit too. Um, I like to make sure that my Mondays are free so that I can prepare for the client meetings that I have later on in the week. I'm definitely mostly calendar focused. Yeah. And if anybody has any organizational tools that they use um, and they want to share, I know a lot of my clients use something called Asana. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't personally use it, but um, as an organizational tool. And this comes up a lot with even our existing business clients around how to, oh yeah, Monday. Yeah, thanks. I've heard of that too. Um, about people trying to figure out how to organize their time so that they can spend more time thinking mm -hmm. and moving projects forward in a way that isn't hundred percent tactical, just checking things off a list. And I think we can all relate to that, which is sometimes it's easier to just look at a to-do list and check things off than it is to think big picture about where am I going with this project? Where am I going within this organization, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so. Amazing. Yeah, and it was also interesting coming from a place where I had a big team to manage and those tools like Asana or Microsoft Teams were crucial to how we got our work done. And it's different for me now um, where I'm mostly, you know, we're working with more than 250 clients, individuals or families. So the client relationship management aspect of that is where we really have to stay organized. So we use a Microsoft product. Salesforce is another one that people in this um, in this job use, but you know, copious notes, and a lot of that is for legal and compliance reasons. Um, but a lot of that too just helps us stay really organized. It's when I was managing two clients at a marketing agency, um, I took a notes, but you didn't have to, you know, write down every detail of a conversation that you had because you would probably talk to that person the next day. Sometimes I talk to clients once a quarter. So I have to go back and look at, well, what did we talk about, you know, three months ago? Yeah. Great question. Libby, um, I'm gonna lean into you for just one second. Yes. Libby, marketing, marketing team at Ama La Vida and um, also came from corporate America. Do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, so Ama La Vida is an entrepreneurial company that was started by two female founders. Do you want to, can you at all reflect on um, the systems that continue to evolve on behalf of the organization as it grows? Is that a fair question to ask you? I can, I can speak to it a little bit. I don't want to monopolize all the time, but I'll say, um, you know, especially as a startup, it's always interesting balancing the tools that are perhaps known as best practices or best in class with what we can actually afford and what meets the needs of where we're at right now. So that's really been an interesting growth challenge for us. Um, the, we use a CRM for all of our managing all of our clients and projects that we have in place called Insightly. And we're working pretty closely with the team there to build that out. And then we do use Asana for some of our project management um, from the marketing team, we looked at, I'm a recovering project manager. So I have experience with a lot of different tools and I love a good project management software system. And we ended up going with um, Notion as our content management system for the marketing team specifically, which we I like because it's really flexible, um, but full disclosure, I have a phenomenal content manager who built that for me in a way that works really well. So I think it's really important to just, I'm honestly, I'm a huge fan of a spreadsheet. Like give me a spreadsheet any day of the week and I keep 
it keeps me very happy. But as you grow, you need something that's a little bit higher powered. Did that answer your question, Betsy? Yeah, that's great. I just thought we could, you know, give a little bit more perspective. What I'm hearing, um, what I'm hearing in the summary sort of on this point is there's an issue of poking around and personal preference for sure. There's also this ongoing needs and budget assessment in, in an entrepreneurial business. What do I need? What can I afford? How do I find the middle ground? Um, and, you know, do I have the network I need to ask these questions, to get ideas and suggestions, to possibly hire people who can help me do the things that are distracting me from the real work of starting this business? Do I have a budget for that, et cetera? Um, I'm laughing. I, have ha I had a client about a year ago. She worked at a nonprofit in the marketing role. She had an idea for a, a business launch. And the thing that was holding her back was she felt very uncomfortable. And we're gonna, I'm going to get into this with Megan too, but promoting herself on social media. She said, but this business I know will not work unless I am comfortable promoting myself on social media. She has stopped coaching because she's ended up launching her business, but I follow her on Instagram and she's all over the place. So somehow she grew into this space, felt she could learn how to use social media appropriately for the business she's developing and has actually been successful doing it. Once again, what's the story that might be holding you back from throwing yourself at your big idea? So just something to consider. Like but that. Megan, that does, oh, oh sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I see Chen has had her hand raised for a while, and I was going to see if maybe we wanted to pivot over and answer another question. Sure. Yeah, Libby, thank you for um, pronouncing my name correctly. I know that's a hard one. Um, I'm Chen, <coughs> Megan, and Betsy, thank you for this great topic. I actually have a two-part question. Some of them actually tied into what you have talked about. Um, so my background is I worked in corporate America for about 15 years, actually ended up resigning from a leadership job because I was completely burned out. And I did a lot of introspection similar to what you did, Megan. And I decided I wanted to open up my own coaching and speaking business, a team of one, basically. Um, so I have a lot of things that's going my way. I really feel the alignment of my passion. I have the support of my family. So the two part question, one is how do you think through, um, once you launch, how do you think through the process of deciding this may be a bad idea because I'm not able to get clients versus um, I need to push through because I don't know how to brand myself. I don't know how to do business development. You know, How do you decide What's that inflection point? You need to pivot or you need to persevere. The second mm -hmm. question, Betsy, is to your point about um, how do you build your own brand? How do you yeah. put yourself out there to, especially when you have a team of one, um, to attract clients to do the business development? Yeah. And it actually ties in with where you were going, Betsy, on social media too. Um, yeah, I know go ahead, Megan, and then we can try to get a little bit more specific. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I know for me that was certainly a big consideration because I had spent years building my brand as this person that did brand marketing, and I would, you know, publish things on LinkedIn about it and publish on my personal Instagram if I was going to, you know we were accepting a marketing award or something like that. Like people knew that that's what I did. Um, but this new role, there's a much deeper blend of personal and professional life. Number one, because I am my marketing department. And number two, because my friends, family, their friends and family are my prospects that, you know, the number one way to build your book of business in a role like this. And it sounds like in a role, like what you're pursuing is referrals. Um, I very rarely get someone that stumbled upon my website and calls and asks for a point of view. It's, they were talking to somebody who already works with us and they would like a second opinion. So I was apprehensive. Um, and honestly, the it's trite, but fake it till you make it. I, I started publishing articles on LinkedIn. Um, I started to get published in 
mostly women focused publications where I could talk about simple things that might be on people's minds. So what do you do with the 401k that you left at an old employer? Um, let me sh let me show you what the options are. And people read those articles and reached out to me. And a lot of my former colleagues um, at the marketing agency are actually my clients now because we were connected on LinkedIn. They read those articles. They have since left also. Um, and they left their 401k behind there. So my article <laughs> reached them at a perfect time. Um, yeah. So I think that the, that third party credibility was helpful. You know, if someone was willing to publish my presumably fact-checked article, uh, I must have some credibility. And then I think also for me, the partnership was really important because the decision to hire someone to manage your money um, is a really big one. And I recognized that I, I didn't have 100% of the credibility that I needed to do that. So, you know, co-branding myself with someone who had been doing that for 30 years was really important to me. Yeah. So I, I want to go back and we don't, we don't have the time right now, Jen, to answer all of your questions and um, you, you can follow up with, with me or another leadership coach at Amalavita if you want, but the couple things I would consider and Megan chime in, please, if you agree or disagree, but um, in terms of deciding what, whether you, whether the pivot or persevere question, and I love those two P words, um, you need to get super clear, obviously, on what success would look like, what level of, and, and it may be about finance, it might may be about just sheer number of clients, it may be about the impact that you're making, you know, there are a whole different way, bunch of ways to measure success. And then you have to start asking yourself those important questions, which is how long am I willing to wait to get to that place? How much time, energy, money am I willing to invest to get to that place? How energized am I from this process or possibly how depleted, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things that you can start to measure for yourself. Um, and I, I'm guessing if you sat and thought of it and you could start to dig into those questions, that is good work for a coach as well. In terms of building a brand, I think Megan made a really interesting point uh, for her business, and you may be able to do the same kind of thinking around yourself, which is based on what I'm trying to do, who needs what I can de deliver? Who needs what from me? What am I uniquely able to deliver? And Megan saying when she launched the business, and I don't know where it is now, that she felt like people who were walking in the same path that she had taken who were approximately in the same, it sounds like fairly demographic from a professional standpoint, were likely to be her customers and so are clients. And so the objective was how do you attract their attention, give them comfort that you have some expertise in that field. I'm guessing it's grown from there, but that those people were the low hanging fruit mm -hmm. and so gave her the momentum that she needed. So Again, there's so much work to be done around that, but that's sort of what I heard in Megan's story. Yeah. And when I think that, when I started, oh, go ahead. Also, what other centers of influence can you tap into that might be good? You know, not necessarily a formal business partner, but someone that is also working with the type of client that you should be working with. So for me, those are estate planning attorneys who they've just created a will and a trust for somebody. Um, this person now, you know, needs somebody to manage their investments, or it could be an accountant. Um, you know, it could be a business coach. It could be people, people that tend to work with someone one-on-one -on -one and have a deep understanding of what's going on with their personal financial or familial situation. So just setting up coffees with those people and, you know, make it about the mutual referral too. What types of clients would it be you know, should I be sending to you? What type of people do you work with? And um, we get a lot of clients that way too. Great, great conversation. Um, so we have another question, Betsy, that is actually for you. Um, okay. Curious about your recent transition from solopreneur coach to coach with an affiliation to Amalavita. Yeah, you know, um, I had a marketing background, but I realized that I was spending the vast majority of my time on marketing and less time on finessing my coaching skills, which is an ongoing journey, um, as Libby would certainly tell you. Um, 
And so then I was lucky, lucky enough to meet the, the women who started Ama La Vida. I love the women focused business, although we have many male clients, it was owned and run by two women. Um, and I decided that I wanted to jumpstart my coaching experience. And in fact, that has been what's been possible. Although we all try to support Libby and her marketing efforts on behalf of the organization, um, I spend the bulk of my time with clients. And I feel like I'm getting to be a better coach every single day as a result of that, as opposed to having to figure out how to apply my marketing skills to market myself. I was just ready for that change. Um, so it's been, it's been a great journey for me. I, I weighed in on the Daniel Pink book. I have not read the book, but he's been interviewed by a number of people over the past month. And there, there are a lot of, um, if you don't have time to read the whole book, just Google him on um, podcasts and he'll come up all over the place. And he outlines some of the things that you may consider either not doing what the thing you're challenging yourself to do is, or staying where you are, or jumping too quickly. So he really gives a nice frame for work for um, analyzing regret. So thanks for bringing that up. I noticed that we have about 15 minutes um, left. I do want to um, talk to Megan about, just pr prompt you on that topic that we were just on just a little bit further, because I thought it was really interesting. And it's related to the last question you all asked me as well, which is, how do you get comfortable promoting yourself? How do you get comfortable saying, I'm a great financial advisor. I'm a great coach. I'm a great landscape architect, whatever it may be. How do you get comfortable doing that when you've never had to do it before? Yeah. So I'll bounce that to you, Megan, because you, you and I have talked about that. Yeah. I think at first it really started with we versus I. You know, I talked about my team as a collective and the collective experience that we brought to the table. Um, with my marketing background, I started applying for essentially things to say. So Forbes best advisors list and Barron's top 100 advisors and like, you know, looking for, give me something that I can go out there and say about our team. Um, so that, that um, again, third-party credibility was really helpful. And I think eventually just with a little bit of time, I did get comfortable saying, well, I'm an expert in this now. And I, I think that, you know, at first I was writing the articles, I, I had the basics down, but I didn't have a lot of real world client experience. And I think that's what it took, just getting my feet wet a little bit to feel like I, I do this now, you know, this is, I'm no longer new. Um, and it has to become part of my identity if I want to be successful, because I, in order to be successful, I need my network to understand that I'm a person that they can come to with these questions. And I, I really do try to keep it informal in that way. You know, I'm, I don't work for a big wall street company. Um, we, we work much like realtors do where we run our own business, but some of our overhead and, you know, the healthcare benefits, for example, I luckily don't have to worry about. Um, but I want it to be different than a lot of the financial advice that you see. I, I did think that was a gap. And actually 17% of the industry is um, female in, in private wealth management. So I knew that there was a different voice that was needed. And I, I tried to own it from that perspective that I felt comfortable coming from. That's you're on mute. mute. Does anyone want to chime in with any feedback or thoughts around this notion of suddenly self-promoting and how that feels or where that might be a stumbling block? Okay, feel free to reach out to us if you know if you start if you start getting to that place. We do have another question in the chat if you'd like that. See? Great. Awesome. Okay, um, so Paige asks, since you wear many hats as an entrepreneur, do you have any advice on how you approach learning the things you don't know or have expertise in that are critical to being successful? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think one thing is what we've already talked about, which is having a partner that kind of complements the skill set that you already have. So you have someone to turn to for questions that, you know, maybe are 
closer to their background and experience, but also ask questions. I mean, you could Google for hours, but the best way to get a question answered is to pick up the phone and call someone who you think might have that answer. And I mentioned the kind of centers of influence approach that I took to building my book of clients, but that's a really great way to get to know people too. You know, if a client comes to you, this is very specific to my business, but they have a question about how their trust or taxes work, you know, call another person, maybe they're local to your community and tell them a little bit about the situation and you'll build a relationship and get an answer to your question. And it's kind of a twofer. Yeah, I think it's important. We haven't talked about this um, there. I, I know at least in Chicago, and I'm sure we cannot be unique here, that there are so many entrepreneurial communities that are focused either women or the kind of business that you're trying to build or our desire to share resources. You're good at this and I'm good at that. And how can we you know, help each other? And I, I really would recommend doing a little research to see if there are communities like that, that you can join, even if they're not local, and maybe it doesn't matter, you know, in this day and age. So um, Megan's really talking about using your own network. And I'm also encouraging you all to build a network of other entrepreneurs who may be able to support you. Yeah. And I did also, you know, take some steps beyond the, the required licensing to do more advanced certifications. Um, so, you know, I, I took an executive education class that certified me in high net worth family money management. And that was something that I thought would be really helpful to bring to our business and kind of round out some areas of, of this field that I wasn't so familiar with. So see if there are, you know, courses too. Mine was entirely on Zoom um, and it was very easy to do with my work schedule. I'm sure that that exists for almost any career you can think of. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, we can Betsy, probably go on with me. Oh, yeah. Betsy, if I, if I may, I want to get back to the, the really great question you asked about people's experience about promote, promoting themselves. I think it's a great yeah. question because there's a lot of hidden beliefs tied into it. Um, fortunately, mm -hmm. I think I was okay with that, but my experience has been um, recently I was promoting a uh, webinar I was doing on burnout and you know I leaned into it because I had a lot of experience in that I can speak to that <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, and I was co-blending this with a women's only um, kind of community network so both of us were promoting this in various ways. I recorded a yep. sizzle reel. We have um, kind of this, it's it's an intimate environment environment for um, women to lean in. So the space is yeah. limited. Um, so we did a lot of promotion, but ended up there were only four people signing up. Three of them were the people that I know of. So yeah. I guess my experience is we really leaned into it. We tried a lot of different things on different channels, but the result was still a little bit puzzling for us. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure Libby could talk about this all day because we're always studying at Ama La Vida what makes certain of our webinars so much more compelling than others. There is for sure, Chin, a right place and a right time. Targeting the right people, the right content, for the moment, et cetera. And getting that figured out is, it's, it's a process of fine tuning. It really is. Um, yeah, we could talk about this all day, but both Megan, um, Libby and I are former marketers. So we could talk about this with you all day, but, but it, it, it's a bit of an art and a bit of a science. And um, I guess the biggest thing I would have you consider is, what do you wanna do differently next time? What did you learn from that? What might you do differently next time? What would a good result for your next webinar look like? And just keep seeing if you still have it in you to pull forward with the next thing, what would make your offering unique? So for now, that's as much as I'll say, but yeah, we, we could certainly get into that. I'm sure it was frustrating. Mm -hmm. Libby, are there any other questions and or does anyone have any other questions, particularly for Megan? I don't see anything in the chat, chat yet, but I'm going to drop all of our contact information in here again. 
in case anyone missed it at the beginning or wants to be able to book sessions um, either for a free consultation with Amalavita or with Megan. And then also, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be sending out a recap email at the end of this. Um, so that'll go out. Keep an eye on your inboxes probably tomorrow that will come through. So um, yeah, that will include resources, will include the recording, which will again also be up on YouTube. So if you can't find it, just search for us on YouTube and it'll be right there. Um, we only have five minutes left. Hilda, do you think you can ask your question quickly? I wanna make sure we get to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the questions that I have is how to consider growing sustainably at the beginning. I think I have a really hard time right now of not exploiting my own working hours as I try and like build up a business. And so I'm curious if you all have. Oh, Hilda, Hilda, you broke went up, on... but I'm, I'm, I'm oh, guessing sorry. that you're asking for tools for, for time management. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. And a bit of it also just of setting like realistic expectations for yourself in terms of how quickly you can really grow or build products while, while at the same time trying to attract clients so that you have people mm -hmm. to sell the products and services to. Yeah. Well, I talked about my time blocking mechanism a little bit, but also, you know, at the very beginning and deciding whether I was going to make this switch and kind of understanding what the time commitment was going to look like for even just the licensing requirements, for example, I realized that that was going to feel like a full-time job. So, you know, one thing that I was weighing was, do I do this nights and weekends or do I make the jump now you know, get all of the licensing done so that I can start this career. And that's what I decided to do. I, I went back to business school um, on nights and I had no free time and it was, it was stressful. And I knew that I didn't want to do that again. So it, you know, it took some, okay, what's the emergency fund that I need to have since I'm not going to have any money coming in the door my rent's not going to go away. So um, thinking about all of those practical considerations and then making the time to do what I needed to do to make the switch. And um, that's, I recognize, not always possible for everybody, but you know, I think understanding what that time commitment is will help you decide when and how um, you're going to get that done. Yeah, that's great. And um... You know, also I would just say, really start to notice when you feel energized and when you feel drained as you're using your time so that you can pace yourself as you go through uh, both setting real, realistic expectations, setting boundaries and living up to your own expectations. So again, that's, I, I'm not just promoting coaching, but that is the kind of thing a coach can help you get very real about um, if it feels like it's a priority right now. It's all this stuff is tricky. Um, I really wanna thank everybody um, all, I at Ama La Vida, as well as Libby, and I'm sure other, Libby is our head of market, she also does a little bit of coaching, but our leadership coaches and life coaches um, are glad to, you know, answer quick questions that you have or do the free consult. And Megan's been really clear about how she might be able to support um, any of you as you're navigating the financial components of making this kind of shift. And um, we really appreciate you joining us and um, are, are so glad to see your Names, if not faces. Thank you for having me. Thank you, ladies. This was wonderful. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, all of you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.